So among all the efforts of this conference to help us re-see, or perhaps I think it's better to say, among all the efforts here to turn off eyes and turn on ears and skin so that we might feel our way into ethically stretching relationships with the sentient and all that other stuff and things, within all that, Wendy Chun constructs a particular bringing into focus of conjoined plastic, metal, time, the imaginable, the unimaginable, and the neoliberal. Her last book begins with questions that are an epistemological parallel to others that have been asked here. Who, she asks, really knows what lurks behind our smiling interfaces, behind the objects we click and manipulate? Who completely understands what one's computer is actually doing at any given moment? Her writing makes palpable, and I know this from teaching it, her writing makes palpable that freedom for relationality, political, collective, current, might, at least partially, exist in the middle of things that are those computers, those smiling interfaces, that are networks. And that those possibilities depend both on our being vulnerable and being afraid. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you for that introduction. And um, I want to start by thanking Richard for organizing this fantastic conference and inviting me today. All I have to say is, wow. Yesterday was so fabulous, the plenaries, the panels. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have this opportunity to share my work in progress with you. Um, but let me warn you that even though it's 9 AM on Saturday, and this is like probably harder for me than you. I mean, this is brutal. So let me warn you that even though it's 9 AM on Saturday, I will talk quickly. Um, there's just, I want to give you a sense of all the questions and observations driving my current book project, Imagine Networks Local Connections, which is impossible to do in 15 minutes uh, unless I speak really quickly. So I will talk very quickly. I will lay out my argument schematically and visually. I will show you far more than I read so that in the end you may be a little dizzy. Um, but this, I promise, will serve a purpose. Um, but just in case you get lost, let me start with the punchline, um, a punchline that punches through the talk and that I end with, um, namely that a banal and impoverished notion of friendship grounds the individuating, humanizing, neoliberal logic of networks, that our desire for something like safe, reciprocal, authenticating, if not entirely authentic type of intimacy, our desire for friendship as friending is threatening to reduce the internet to a series of gated communities. Gated communities in which we're most in danger because we think we're most safe. That further, out of care, out of the sometimes genuine care we have for others, we put them at risk. That spam is another way to say, I love you. At the same time, I want to suggest that if our desire for something like safe intimacy, if our belief in computers as personal is exactly what puts us in danger, I want to suggest that this danger can be best attenuated not through more or better security, not through security that reduces the private to the secure, not through a security that tames networks by humanizing them, by personalizing them, but rather through a wary embrace a wary embrace of the vulnerability that is networking, a non-human vulnerability that's currently covered over by our odd reduction of computers to their interfaces, by our odd assumption that computers are a form of visual culture. So again, but with a very different tone and tenor, spam as another way to say, I love you. Another image I want to start with, having called uh, the visual into question, is my packet sniffer, um, which has, since earlier this moment, I think some of you saw this earlier as well, I put it up, 
um, which has been quietly running in the background and quietly and machinically revealing all the packets sent to and received by my computer. So for all of you unfamiliar with packet sniffers, they're software programs that analyze local area network traffic. And although used by the hackers and FBI, they were developed by sysops to diagnose networks that are always failing. Right? Most obviously, the sniffer reveals that interactivity cannot be reduced to user-generated mouse clicks, right? I'm not doing anything, and yet my computer is constantly sending and receiving, receiving and storing. That is non-humanly reading packets, many of which simply read, can you read me? This is my packet sniffer saying, can you read me? Can you read me? <laughs> now, I could easily put this packet sniffer into promiscuous mode, which I won't do. Um, for conventional rather than ethical reasons. Um, but importantly, promiscuous mode is the default, right? So your network card automatically reads in all packets and then deletes those not directly addressed to it, right? Which means not only have you read in everyone's traffic, it also means that you've downloaded all sorts of illegal materials without you knowing. So the question we need to ask is, given that our computers always act promiscuously, Given that your computer's monogamy is due to a secondary reparative action, right? You and your machines are monogamous because we delete our promiscuous actions. Um, why even call it promiscuous mode? The very notion of your card as promiscuous depends on a conventional, and I would even say ideological, imagining of, networked, of, of your network computer as faithfully under your control. Right? And this normalization makes us vulnerable, indeed makes possible things like back orifice attacks. How many are you familiar with back Yeah, Yeah, so basically what happens is a port's opened on your computer and software is usually installed so your computer becomes a host or a server without meaning to, right? Um, this packet sniffer thus reveals that a personal network computer can only be an oxymoron, right? Can only be that our perception of how networks work, of, our, of how our increasingly translucent yet obfuscatory interfaces operate is linked to a certain imagining of networks, a certain political imagining of networks that is deeply contradictory a political imagining of networks that's instrumental to a larger reimagining of the public-private divide that grounded um, liberal democracy to that of open versus closed, right? So think, for example, of the transformation of the internet from a public good to a mass medium, albeit a mass medium to end the very notion of mass, to end the possibility of the allegedly or possibly silent masses, transforming them into chattering yous. Um, this transformation of a, the internet from a public good to a mass medium through the US government selling its backbone to private corporations. Right? Think as well of the difference between public domain and open source, the way the open source thrives on and spreads licenses everywhere. Think of the difference between a public square and a mall. Think as well of the difference and similarities between these two imaginings of the internet. So the early internet, in which freedom stemmed from anonymity, from no one knowing your dog, right? So the internet was a free space because it, al it allegedly severed our bodies and mind, allowing our authentic inner self to finally be revealed, right? And as I note in my first book, this is a really odd understanding of the internet, right? Given the public and promiscuous exchange of information that grounds the internet, given that the internet is a control protocol, how on earth did we ever think the internet was an anonymous space of freedom, right? But we've moved from this sort of virtual understanding of the internet to this, right? An equally strange notion of the internet as a semi-private space in, of true names and true images. The notion of the internet as augmenting, as augmented reality. And in this semi-private space, freedom stems from knowing who's a dog and who isn't, right? And the authentic increasingly stems from the privately authenticating, from use value. And leaves you vulnerable to people taking pictures of you, right, and posting them to Facebook, right? Okay.
So part one, imagine networks. For the past decade or so, and I must say, getting old's nice, you get to say stuff like for the past decade or so. Nine o'clock Saturday morning, still rough though, okay. So for the past decade or so, I've been trying to understand the political and conceptual power of networks. Clearly, to emphasize the importance of networks is hardly new or profound, right? Um, from Manuel Castells' exhausted description of network society in relation to informational capitalism, to Duncan Watts' call for a network science that brings together sociologists, computer science, and physicists in order to understand our new connected age, to Hardin Negri's diagnosis of US um, imperial powers, network power, to contemporary military theorizations of terrorist swarms, to Tiziana Terranova's really brilliant analysis of global network culture, networks have been the subject of much theoretical investigation. Networks themselves have also become prized theoretical tools, from Deleuze and Guattari's discussion of rhizomatic structures to Bruno Latour's call for after network theory, networks have become central to theory. Indeed, to exaggerate slightly, and this is only a slight exaggeration, networks encapsulate everything that's allegedly new about our current era. From high-speed financial networks that erode national sovereignty, to Twitter feeds that foster new political alliances, to unprecedented globe-spanning viral vectors that threaten worldwide catastrophe, networks allegedly encapsulate the new global formation, the new social institutions, the new global capitalism, the new global contagion. Further, the concept of networks is what defines these new global formations and what links them together. This assertion of networks, and in particular decentralized networks, as the diagram of our current social formation, which is Alex Galloway's formulation, has spawned much predictable controversy and debate. Controversy and debate centered around questions like, are networks really new? Haven't we always had networks? What, you know, what is network? Now, I'm less interested in this question, not because I believe networks are ahistorical, but rather because such a debate, are networks really new, one that usually reflects a desire to see networks everywhere, assumes that we already know what a network is and does. So my question is less, do we live in a network society or are networks really new? And more, why do we believe the network, however described, to diagram our current social formation? Right? That is, what is the explanatory power of networks? Why and how has the phrase, it's a network, become the end rather than the beginning of an explanation? Right? Most basically, my question is, what do we mean when we say we're connected? And to what extent is a connection something temporal rather than spatial? Something driven by events, events that are really difficult to represent in sort of static network maps. In other words, to what extent is a network or what's important about a network circulation rather than infrastructure? Right? To what extent that is, are networks, are maps of networks always too early and too late? To what extent are they always projections or traces? And to what extent does time mark the difference between a net and a network? Networks are very strange entities. Modern networks stem from structures built to transport vehicles and electricity, right? structures deliberately constructed to resemble nets. Remarkably, though, networks have moved from planning tools or ideal structures to actually existing human and non-human entities that are empirically discovered. Systems biology presumes the existence of networks in animals from the genetic to the multicellular. Ecology similarly conceptualized food webs and less lethal animal interactions as networks. So a big field and an emerging field right now in ecology is animal social networks. So networks both dehumanize, reduce us to molecular interactions, and also individualize those who would not be human. Animals become social. 
This insistence on networks as actually existing empirical entities happens even as, as many network scientists will admit, network analysis is itself an abstraction. Right? Network analysis replaces the real thing with a mathematical model, a mathematical model that engages selectively with our allegedly data-rich world. And importantly, data too is both too late and too early. It's a trace that is restored. Networks are thus both theoretical diagram and a way to explicate actually existing phenomena. Indeed, they compromise the distinction between the constructed and the natural, the theoretical and the imperial, empirical, the human and the non-human. To map is both to plan and to solve, right? To describe and prescribe. We follow Google Maps. We just don't, we don't go to Google Maps for a description of what we should do, right? But rather the combination of description and instruction. Further, network analysis fosters, it depends on networks. Networks are not only useful to diagnose contagion, they are themselves contagious. Right? It takes a network to analyze networks. Networks generate networks. As Watts argues, in order for the new network science of networks to secede, it must become a manifestation of its own subject matter. A network of scientists collectively solving problems that cannot be solved by any single individual or even any single discipline. Networks make porous the boundaries between the many disciplines that employ networks, from economics to media studies, from political science to biology. Every discipline that is seems to have found networks, finding networks, they found each other, right? And this new universal structure. In a similar vein to Watts, albeit with a very different purpose and methodology, Bruno Latour argues that in order to perform actor network theory, one must become an ant, a blind, myopic, workaholic, trail sniffing, and collective traveler. To understand ant, one must become one. There seems then to be no end to networks or their analyses, only more webs to be spun. To open up this web and to make it's the network, the beginning, rather than the end of the story, I've been increasingly thinking of them as imagined. Um, to be clear, by focusing on networks as imagined, I'm not arguing that they don't exist. I'm not arguing that they're fanciful, imaginary structures. I'm not saying that quorum sensing doesn't happen, that autoinducers and pheromones don't act like signaling molecules. I'm not saying that wires, transmitters, and repeaters aren't important. I am arguing, though, that the force of networks stems in part from how they figure connections and flows that both link and breach the personal and the social, the political and the technological, the biological and the machinic. By the ways they spatialize the temporal, giving us a way to produce a map, an image, a trace of the many myriad interactions around us. And in calling them imagined, as I'll elaborate a little more later, I'm drawing from and revising Benedict Anderson's um, influential and controversial assertion that nations are imagined political communities. I'm not, however, just gesturing towards Anderson. I'm also gesturing, gesturing towards the ways in which networks are so powerful in part because they allow us to imagine, or at the very least to trace, the unimaginable the unimaginable world of global climate change, the unimaginable world of global capital, even as they participate in, even as they indeed create unforeseeable and unimaginable futures and presents. That is, they become so compelling in part because they've been key to dispelling postmodern confusion, to replacing the pastiche with the zoom and the overview, to enabling a form of resolution that allegedly brings together two seemingly unreproachable scales, the molar and the molecular, the individuating and the generic. So part two, mapping the unimaginable. Networks, even as they engender ever more connections and unpredictable events, have been key to ending postmodern confusion and establishing an era of neoliberal empowerment. 
To make this point, let me turn to Fred Jameson's really influential diagnosis of postmodernism. So Jameson, in the mid-1980s, argued that capitalism, since the 19th century, um, since the era of industrial and imperial capitalism, has made it harder and harder to conceive of our position in the world. This is because, increasingly, the truth of our seemingly authentic experiences lies elsewhere. Right? So the truth of 19th century English domestic life, tea, lay in India. This discontinuity between what's authentic and true, he contends, is amplified in the era of postmodernity. In the era of postmodernity, cities and all spaces are more unmappable because this new postmodern space suppresses distance. There's no sense of anything as erratic, right? As anything of having a unique place in time and space. This new postmodern space relentlessly saturates remaining voids and empty places, so there's no gaps no sacred spaces. And this postmodern space, and in this postmodern space, the postmodern body is exposed to a perpetual barrage of immediacy from which all sheltering um, layers and intervening mediations have been removed. This saturation of space, Jameson argues, leads to a new and historically unique dilemma. We are inserted, he argues, as individual subjects into a multi-dimensional set of radically discontinuous realities, whose frames range from the still surviving spaces of bourgeois private life all the way to the unimaginable decentering of global capital itself. This decentering, this historically new dilemma, makes it impossible for us to cognitively map our relations to totality, to realize our place within the late capital system. This conception of individual subjects is caught in an overwhelming, unrepresentable, unimaginable global system was eerily repeated across disciplines, from sociology to economics, from ecology to physics. Ulrich Beck, writing in 1986 and analyzing the emergence of what he called a risk society, similarly contended, intentionally or not, through accident or catastrophes in war or peace, a large group of the population faces devastation and destruction today for which language and the powers of our imagination fail us, for which we lack any moral or medical category. We are concerned with the absolute and unlimited not, which threatens us here, the unengendered General, unimaginable, unthinkable, un, un, un. In a less ap apocalyptic and also less utopian matter, um, Mark Granovetter, writing in 1973, also argued that the personal experience of individuals is closely bound up with larger scale aspects of social structures well beyond their purview or control. And to understand the relationship between personal experience and larger systems, he produced one of the first social maps, which we're looking at here, which he argued proved the strength of weak ties. So for Jameson and for Granovetter, maps and mapping were key to resolving this dilemma. To resolve our postmodern ennui, this sort of slackening of affect, Jameson called for a not yet imagined form of art, a political socialist form of cognitive mapping that would enable us to regain um, our ability to act. And although Jameson, you know, throughout this essay says, I don't know what this is going to look like, it's unimaginable, um, he does refer to cyberpunk and other sort of auto-referential postmodern narratives um, as, as that play with reproductive technology as a degraded figure of the, the, the late capitalist world that needs to be mapped. And let me just note that this is a really strange formulation, right? So as I argue in my second book, and as was nicely pointed out, um, we're, count, we're called on to map the unknowable, the unknowable world of global capital through another unknowable, namely technology itself. Right? So I'm trained as an engineer and I can tell you theoretically what my computer is doing at every level, but I can't tell you what it's doing now. Right? But what's important is not simply this not knowing, but the not knowing embedded within a structure of techno, technical knowability that makes it so compelling. Networks, acts of mapping, were to enable us to trace, if not represent, the movement of seemingly unseeable entities, to imagine the unimaginable, from affects to capital, 
from environmental toxins to global climate change. And importantly, this promise of mapping cuts across very different understanding of networks um, and what maps are to do. So if for Jameson and Granovetter, maps and networks were key to reconnecting the macro to the micro, the societal to the individual, um, for others, most influentially Deleuze and Guattari, the promise of maps stemmed from the ways in which they frustrated precisely these moves towards transcendental and totalizing discourses. Taking up the figure of the rhizome, um, an imminent root structure that emphasizes connection, heterogeneity, and multiplicity, they argued that the rhizome is a map, not a tracing, where a map is open and connectable in all of its dimensions. It can be torn, reversed, adapted to any kind of mounting, reworked by an individual, group, or social formation. The map has to do with performance. Okay. But we now seem to be in a new and perhaps historically original dilemma. We are, it seems, forever mapping, forever deciding, forever empowered, and yet no less able to foresee or intervene decisively into the global formations around us. Mapping that, seems, it is, that, mapping that is seems to follow the logic of the network rather than offer us a resolution or a way to intervene. So we can move from the zoom to the overview, the detail to the point, but we still seem to be forever moving and never changing. Even worse, we have become so dependent on our networking technologies that we seem to be incapable of acting without them. Right? So in other words, the tools that we use to augment reality have in many ways come to supplant reality. Think of the trust we put in Google Maps. Right? I, I follow Google Maps even when I know they're wrong. I've done this commute for so long, but somehow they found an exit off the highway that I just didn't know existed, right? <laughs> Google Maps, in many ways, comes, comes to represent what Slavoj Žižek has called symbolic authority, right? Another space in which what matters more is their representation rather than our own experience, right? Think of, as well, the obsessive documentation that happens on Facebook. Right? So for many, it seems an event doesn't happen unless it's on Facebook. Right? Reality is a place to take pictures that you could post on Facebook. Right? So in this way, Facebook, oddly, has come to stand in for theory. Right? So if theory or theoria was once a group that witnessed event right, in order to say it happened, in a weird way, Facebook has taken this position of theory. Right? To be is to be updated, right? To be both the object of and subject to updates. Further, the performance of desire and the move to deterritorialize, as Bifo Berardi has pointed out, has become the basis of neoliberal capitalism, right? Desire is a field, not an escape. So most pointedly, my question is this. What's the difference between neoliberal discourses of empowerment and these calls for resistance? Networks and their analyses seem to have caused as many crises and dilemmas as they've resolved. Right? Consider, for instance, financial software that made possible um, complex aggregates of assets that allegedly risk-free complex network assets that drove the financial crisis because they spread risk everywhere, right? Because in the end, it was impossible to know which bundles had toxic assets and which didn't. So networks thrive on a certain ignorance. Networks often stop when we demand to know what's actually circulating. Um, think more positively of global climate change models. Um, and here you're seeing a, a projection by Gufto. Um, think more positively of global climate change models that try bizarrely for unverifiability. Right? They try to defer the future they predict. There's a very odd temporality to these models. As many climate scientists will admit, by the time we know they're true or not, it'll be too late. So if we believe they're true, we will act in such a way that we'll never know if they're true or not. Right? And I bring this up not because I'm a climate change denier. Right? CO2 raising temperature, what, only known for 100 years? Um, 
but rather um, because the space between a prediction and what will happen shows the power, shows the productive power of imagined networks. Uncertainty, in other words, opens up moments of action and decision. But these moments of decision and uncertainty are not outside of networks. Right? So most positively, we may all now be small s sovereign subjects, but through our acts of mapping, we have become even more tightly enmeshed in the system we once thought we were resisting, or even more benignly simply representing. Right? So think of all Think of the computational power. Think of all the greenhouse gases necessary to produce these climate models, right? And importantly, climate is inconceivable without computation, right? The desire to predict and understand weather was one of the driving forces behind the emergence of modern computation. So clearly, this analysis of networks and maps as tools of resistance and comprehension needs to be supplemented by another, namely networks, technological and social, as central to transformations in the production and circulation of capital, something that Castells, Galloway, and Terranova nicely outline. That is, and this is something I argue in my first book, the promise of networks and their analysis as a form of freedom or freeing has been central to the emergence of new forms of control based on networking protocols and on really reductive notions of freedom, right? In which freedom gets reduced to control. Right? So to understand this enmeshing, um, we need to understand that really odd subject position of networks, of Web 2.0, the friend. Um, and importantly, friend and free come from the same root, free meaning dear. We need to understand the centrality of friendship and intimacy to the emergence of chattering yous, and more importantly, to the spread of viruses and spam, other ways to say, I love you. So back very briefly to part one, imagined networks. So as I mentioned earlier, by thinking of networks as imagined, I'm drawing from and revising many sources, including Anderson's influential and much critiqued formulation that nations are imagined political communities. And they're imagined, Anderson argues, because members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, yet in the minds of each lives an image of their communion. Again, they're imagined, not imaginary. And their communities, he argues, because regardless of actual disparities, they're imagined as a horizontal fraternity. And Anderson, in making this argument, stresses the importance of print capitalism to the rise of nationalism, most particularly newspapers, which make time, he argues, homogeneous and empty due to their regularly planned obsolescence. Right? They create what he calls extraordinary mass ceremonies. So reading a newspaper in the privacy of her own home, each communicant is well aware that the ceremony he performs is being replicated simultaneously by thousands of others of whose existence he is confident and yet of whose identity he has not the slightest notion. Okay, so the imagined here the imagined which is produced through a synchronous action links the individual to an anonymous collective. It makes possible an imagined national we. It transforms an I into a we, a national we that comes together chronologically. But newspapers clearly aren't what they used to be. Right? And as the current crisis in um, pu print publications has made clear, we can no longer be sure of these extraordinary mass ceremonies if we ever could. Does this mean, therefore, the death of imagined collectives? No. Although I would argue that our distinctive imagined groupings are not imagined communities, but rather imagined networks. Imagine networks that are both more and less than communities, global collectives that create seemingly direct, traceable trajectories between the local and the global, that link the social historical to the psychical, the collective to the individual, the technical to the social. A global collective that are a series of yous rather than a collective we. And you, importantly, is both singular and plural. But in its plural form, it still refers to individuals as individuals. 
right? In this sense, networks are very different from communities which create a new identity, a we from what is held in common, even if that which we hold in common is our own incommensurability, um, which is, you know, Blunt shows really beautiful thinking of community. In a network, when the we happens, when we have synchronous um, activity, when we have an extraordinary mass ceremony, you usually have a network outage, right? Um, so increasingly, I've been trying to think through the communal, the, the communal understood here as human and non-human as a network weapon. Um, these imagined networks depend not on simultaneous mass ceremonies, but rather asynchronous events that perpetuate through that thrive on crisis. Networks are based on asynchronous events that instead of enabling a homogeneous empty time, a time that buttresses the notion of steady progress, um, produces instead a series of crises or nows that create bubbles in time. And in these bubbles, the new quickly ages and the old is constantly rediscovered as new. So network time is not conducive to imagining a collective entity traveling together through time, but rather to a series of individuals that respond in their own time to singular yet connected events. This creates a long series of seemingly never-ending and ever-repeating events to information as undead. And here you see a chart produced by the, uh, uh, this, this is basically charting the spread of chain emails um, produced by the computer scientists Libin Knoll and John Kleinberg. And if you really believe that the internet is a small world and we're all within six degrees of separation, this map should make no sense, right? You should short and fat. Everyone should get it and it should be over, right? But instead, what we have is this constant perpetuation of these things. And this long, thin time, this constant deferral of decisions is also something that Microsoft has played very um, has played with in their uh, alleged uh, uh, analysis of search engine syndrome. So let me just play you this. We really need to find a new place for breakfast. The Breakfast Club in 1986 called Classic Star members of the Rat Pack. What? So do you want to LCD or plasma? Plasma is an iron ass gas. This time we're going to find cheaper tickets. Cheap skates. Cheap thrills. I'm having this bad pain. Backpacking back to school. You know, I'm Sebastian. Seriously, we need a new place to eat. Eat, eat my dust. Eat. 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 Okay, there's lots to say about this commercial, but, uh, uh, but if you've ever used Bing, it's hardly a decision engine, right? And this desire for decision not only denies the madness that's part of any decision, as Kierkegaard has argued, but also seeks to end all decision by deferring them to Microsoft, right? <laughs> Regardless, these modes of crisis, this call to decide and its endless deferral, um, has made, um, and then this focus on you, have moved media from the mass to the new, from the mass to the you, and have been key to the notion of networks of information as valuable. Um, so part three, friends and frenemies, or it's not us, it's you. So how is value produced? online. Why is Facebook's expected and yet constantly deferred IPO expected to be so big? Right? And I want to bracket here that the question of value online is hardly something that's been solved. Right? It's a, this is an open question. Um, but I'm just addressing one notion of value which stems from, the, from uh, a certain emphasis on data mining. So at one level, it seems simple. Value is generated, networks are valuable because information itself has become a commodity. Right? As many in particular, Castells has argued, what seems unique in our networked age is that information is not simply used to produce a commodity, it itself has become a commodity. 
And at a certain level, this makes complete sense, right? I buy software licenses, we do buy information. But we need to remember that early on, it was unclear that a market would ever emerge on the internet, let alone the internet itself become a market. In the mid-1990s, right, sending one's credit card online was portrayed as an invitation to murder, right? Sandra Bullock's <laughs> gonna die because she sent her credit card on. So again, freedom, empowerment stemmed from anonymity, not authentication. Further, the value of information, when information becomes valuable, exchangeable, seems different with networks, and more importantly, with their obsessive politics of storage. If in the past, as Benjamin argued, the value of information coincided with its newness, now newness does not determine value. Right? So currently, many news organization, so organizations only charge for old information. Right? So you get this American Life for free this week, but you have to pay for archived versions. We pay for information if we do, because we've missed it, either because we want to see it again or because we missed it the first time, are missing registered by constant references to it. Right? So how many of you watch Two Girls, One Cup? No, yeah, right. So what was interesting, of course, was that video went down immediately, but everybody still knew about it because of all of the videos showing people watching that video, right? So think of all the ways in which there are references to things that have been taken down, which signify their importance, right? So repetition, repeated references and likes by friends and strangers mark something as, va something as valuable, as something worth downloading, as something worth visiting. And as this repetition makes clear, value is not generated by you, but rather a plethora of yous. Okay, but to talk about the collective nature of information um, and, and network value is hardly new, right? Yochai Benkler, for instance, has offered an extensive theory of peer-to-peer -peer production in the wealth of networks. Similarly, think of um, Pierre Levy's notion of collective intelligence and Paolo Verno's notion of a general intellect. Yes, but I want to thro think through collective value slightly differently. For what counts as value is not simply our voluntary actions, not simply information we need to act or crowdsourcing, but rather traces of our involuntary movement. The richness of, of uh, network data, our data-rich environment, stems from tracing and storing our every action and linking them to others. Um, so what can be built are affiliation networks. That is, if our world is now data rich, it's not simply because we're all providing content for free, right? No one really cares what you ate last night, um, except maybe your mother. But rather, because every interaction leaves a trace, which is then incorporated and further used to understand you, where you is always both singular and plural. The value of Facebook and Amazon, in other words, depends on the ways in which our traces are analyzed in ways that seek to suspend the difference between the individual and the generic statistical body, even as they respect, even as they insist on this difference. So if once, as Alan Secula influentially argued in relation to the production of photographic evidence, the body and the archive were related through two separate systems of description, one focused on identifying the individual, on inscribing the body within the archive, and the other uh, centered on identifying the hidden type driving the body, right, so embedding the archive in the photograph, now these two processes seem inseparable. Right? So the same process captures data necessary both for identifying individuals and for general identification. Right? Amazon.com, for instance, tracks individual purchases not only to create a record of us, right? In this sense, we need to get over ourselves. Like, it is so easy to identify oneself online. Hint, nobody Googles your name more than you do. Um, so we need to get over us and realize that um, what's important is this identification merged with uh, actions of others so Amazon can make suggestions, so it can predict and encourage future behavior that conforms to, that confirms, that optimizes network analysis. But this only works if we're authenticated online. 
if we're trusted to be telling the truth, if we bought into the one login, one person structure, or if we become enmeshed in an authenticating structure of friends. Another way to understand the importance of yous is through the relationship between you, you are hailed in ideology. Althusser, of course, argued that ideology interpolates individuals as subjects, that ideology represents the imaginary relationship of individuals to the real conditions of existence, where these real conditions are inaccessible. So he describes the theater of ideology where the policeman's hailing you, right? Because you scream, hey you, and the right person turns around. It's great in lecture. If you ever do it, you scream, hey you, and the kids that are doing their emails sort of look up. Um, what's important here is that the person hailed recognizes themselves as hailed, right? Such hailings, he argues, rarely miss their mark. Now, Althusser's notion of ideology is controversial and has gone through a number of revisions. And the revision that I find most compelling that gets me to use rather than you, and so therefore to something both more and less than ideology, in the same way networks are both more and less than community, is Richard Dienst's. So Dienst, thinking through the way television hails us, argues that if ideology can miss its mark, then ideology must have been unstable as a sign and an event. Ideology, in other words, is an event. It's a mass of transmissions that neither hails nor nails its subject in place. He goes on to argue that the fact that it neither hails nor nails the subject in place, that ideology is a mass transmission that's not perfectly destined or centrally disseminated, doesn't take away from the force of ideology, and indeed it grounds it. Far from always connecting, ideology never does. Subjects look in on messages as if eavesdropping, as if peeking at someone else's mail. To express it in a formula, ideology requires a short circuit between the singular and the general so that a reception of a representation becomes a sending back, a representation of a reception. And I find this compelling partly because this short circuiting between the singular and the general is exactly what friending, what following, what liking, what recommending does. The way we become value, the way we short circuit modes of identification and modes of generalization in a network is through our actions and reactions as friends. And I don't think we thought enough of the importance of the really odd transformation of the default user from the lurker, right, who, who's now the stalker, right, the, the move from the lurker to the friend. Um, we, I don't think we've thought through enough the personalization of the impersonal, um, which is brought about by Web 2.0. And I don't think we've grappled with the significance of how authentic authenticity in general has changed online, from being marked by the amateur to being marked by the friend, right? The authentic is more and more the authenticated, right? And let me just note that this is not always the case. An anonymous is a really intriguing example because not only do they refuse the you, they take as their basis the foe rather than the friend, right? To, wh to what extent foe and friend can be um, separated. Now many, um, including most brilliantly Beth Provenelli, have examined the relationship between love and liberal notions of sovereignty and exception. Provenelli has argued that the fantasy of intimate love is so important because it claims to be different from all types of social ties. It potentially disrupts and breaks all these others. At the same time, however, it claims to produce a new form of social glue, a new form of social glue that stitches the rhythms of politics and with the market to the rhythms of the intimate subject. Further, because the self-transformation that comes with love depends on the openness of others to the same transformation, right? Falling in love is an open structure. Autological intimacy, she argues, functions as a proselytizing religion. Like capital, intimacy demands an ever-expanding market. And like capital, intimacy expands through macro-institutional and micro-practices. Friendship, of course, is not quite love, but I would argue it's an even stronger tie, uh, an even stronger mark of small s sovereignty, precisely because it's a weaker relation. 
Friends are allegedly independent subjects who choose their own affiliations, who choose to friend each other. Friends negotiate, in other words, that middle ground between what Provenelli calls autological intimacy and genealogical forms of love. The, the act of friending, of our circulating things to others, of our, to our friends, of liking them, we enmesh them and ourselves even more tightly into networks and their underbelly. Through the care we show for others, through the sometimes genuine care we have for others, we become at times their worst enemies. We spread viruses and spam. Consider, for instance, and this is my favorite example, not Google, um, uh, Think of this, these are viral email messages, right, of warning of viruses that never existed, right? So these messages spread more effectively than the viruses they falsely warn of, right? So out of our own genuine care for everyone, we tell everyone in our address book, look, there's this virus, be aware of it. Then we get the message saying it's spam, and then we email everyone again, say no, disregard that message. And we, in the end, we spread it everywhere. These messages, in other words, act as retroviruses. Um, retroviruses, such as HIV, are composed of RNA strands that use the cell's copying mechanism to insert DNA versions of themselves into the cell's genome. Similarly, these fleeting messages survive by our copying and saving them, by our active incorporation of them into our ever-repeating archive. Through our efforts to foster safety, we spread retrovirally and actually defeat our working antivirus systems. Um, but it's not just our efforts to foster safety that endanger us. Um, corporate efforts to create safe spaces have threatened to turn the internet into a series of gated communities in which we're most vulnerable because we think we're safe. Yeah. So think exactly of what a portal is and does, right? It's a, a portal is an elaborate door that leads us inside, not outside, that encloses us within a seemingly private space. Private spaces that are, as, um, as uh, Elizabeth Bernstein has pointed out, not safer than these allegedly public ones. But I want to end by thinking through intimacy and its dangers is perhaps what's intriguing and wonderful about networks as well. So let me conclude with a little story. Recently, I fell victim to a phishing attack. Um, fell victims, a little strong. As soon as I clicked on that link, I knew this was bad, right? Now, had I not been babysitting two small children at the time, any parents here, two like, hours with two small kids, and I was ready to extend my member and like wire money to Nigeria, right? <laughs> and had I not been using my iPhone, which is a horrible interface, you really can't tell what URL you're going to, I would never have made that mistake. So lesson learned, there is no, always be vigilant online, there's no sort of innocent web surfing, right? Okay, but this phishing attack was brilliant. This private message was sent to me by Fiona Barnett, who runs Haystack Scholars. So the context was perfect, right? And she's a former student of mine, one of my first undergrads. So of course she would care. And I'd just come back from a conference, right? So this phishing attack led to everybody who was following me on Twitter being fished in turn, right? So it outed me as both stupid and possibly paranoid, right? <laughs> so predictably, Many folk contacted me, telling me what I had already known. You've been fished. Um, and so I had to amplify my public embarrassment by then tweeting one of my nine tweets I've ever done, telling everyone that if they clicked on that private message from me, they should change their password. Right? This made me realize that we've been taking the wrong approach to social networking. And from now on, I was only going to friend people I really hate. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> a surprising upside to this that made me decide not to do this, to keep my friends online. Um, given that I hardly ever tweet, this phishing attack allowed me to reach out to those people who might want to follow a 140 character message I have, it allowed me to reach out to them and say, I love you. And one particular exchange made this point to me. So a close colleague of mine had you know, tweeted about this and said, you know, I was honored to get this phishing attack from Wendy Chun. I think she had also fallen victim to it, anyway. But Lily Irani, a brilliant graduate student I had met that summer, posted this in response. 
And in response, I posted this. And although I was half joking at the time, I think there's something to spam as love. Because this, this exchange, for instance, led to us both talking about the relevance of Beth Provenelli's work to our own and the relationship between virtual and actual sores and to the ways in which these sores are always linked to allegedly emerging nations and markets. This loving side of spam should make us rethink the difference between not spam and spam, between human and non-human actions. Okay, so what's the difference, in other words, really between our semi-automatic happy birthday postings that we put on Facebook and those, you know, those emails we get from our friends telling us about dodgy Canadian pharmaceutical companies that we need to go to, to order our Viagra, right? So in other words, Voluntary, involuntary, or not entirely involuntary messages remind us that we're somehow connected to them, right? That we're in their address book, that they care about us enough to put us in danger. <laughs> also, as the f founder of Slashdot noted, slashdotting something, liking it, means taking it down. Right? Again, these moments of we, these moments of synchronicity are intriguingly destructive. Um, there are also moments in which networks are depersonalized, in which we became, become arguably faceless swarms. These interactions remind us that freedom and friendship are experiences that deny subjectivity as much as they make it possible. That friendship can't and should not be reduced to a reciprocal relation. Yes, friendship can be reciprocal, but it is fundamentally unreciprocal. As Jean-Luc Nancy has argued, freedom is an experience. It's an attempt executed without reserve, given over to the peril of its lack of foundation and security in this object of, of which it is not the subject, but instead the passion, exposed like the pirate who freely tries his luck on the high seas. The root for pirate is also the root for both peril and experience. And this kind of freedom, this possibility of friendship comes without guarantees. Freedom is not something we possess, not something that anyone can own and grant another. It's a force that breaks bonds, a form of destruction that, as Nancy argues, enables both friendship and total destruction. Friendship as an experience is both a moment of terror and hope a moment of hosting without meaning or intending to, a moment or an experience of, as Tom Keenan has argued, of being human in a most non-human way, of having to act and respond without knowing how. Thank you. So there's time for questions, or if you all are like tired like me, we can skip them. But no, 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 no. I'm very much interested in, in, in. Yes. Can you say your name, by the way? Um, John Hanson. Hi. Hello. Um, so one aspect of this that I think is, is kind of, so we, we have we have two kind of things going on, right? On the one hand, we have kind of networks, social networks that you know hold thing that kind of schema for perception. Right, a way of understanding things. On the other hand, we have kind of networks, social networks. Um, so one thing that's kind of one one way that that comes together, which you know you didn't mention, but I think is kind of the case in, in how time winds up being managed. Mm -hmm. Of course, information becomes valuable. Particularly on Facebook, in the portion of how it is distracting you or what it indicates about how you can be distracted. Right. right. Um, so I guess I, I, was, I was curious if you could comment a little bit on like, maybe how, how time goes into this. Right. And, and I, I'm obviously I'm just kind of throwing your thought at you. So. Well, thank you for, for throwing the thought. Um, and indeed, one thing I've, I've really been trying to think through is the importance of time to networks, right? And how spatialization is always too late. It's, it's a way of trying to understand um, these temporal events that happen and go, right? So one way I've been thinking about it is, um, and this is in response to Marianne Doan's really influential article, um, Information Crisis Catastrophe, where she argues that television is about catastrophe. Um, but we need to think about crisis as modes of decision and, and ways to intervene. 
I've been thinking of networks increasingly as crisis, crisis, crisis. Right? The moment to decide. One is always called on to act, to decide, in ways that seem, in many ways, to defer the kind of action that it enables. Right? So, so something like the search engine syndrome would be part of this sort of deferral of time that keeps one attentive, distracted and attentive at the same time. Um, so I think that the, the question of time is absolutely central to how we understand value and also how it's not simply time, but it's time punctuated by actions, right? That make it both distracting and attentive at the same time. And I think that to, to think thorough, further through it, um, the question of the event is central because it points out the ways in which networks are never as stable as they appear. Right? So to give you one example, um, current global climate change models, um, the old ecosystem models all, assume, all, all, all were based on leaf size, right? So the assumption there was if something happens, everything of the same leaf size dies. That doesn't happen, right? Um, so what they've been doing is moving from ordinary differential equations to partial differential equations. Because what's important is like a big tree dying fundamentally changes the carbon, um, the carbon cycle of that area, right? So again, that move towards the event, right, is something that both networks strive to understand and can't entirely conceptualize, is central to, to, to exactly what I'm thinking of. And it seems another interesting aspect of it is that uh, kind of how time is kind of, the, or, or how social networks kind of create this understanding of time and distraction and action. It's ultimately part of how they, they replicate, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. You know, the more successful Facebook gets in distracting, right. right, the more successful it is as a mode of perception, right, right. as like a uh, hegemonic. Yeah, and what one should realize is data is never there. Data is always repeated. It's because it's repeated that it remains, right? Yeah. So there's, there's that structure of repetition even at the, the very level of, of receiving information. There's a, there are several questions. <laughs> Um, let's go in a circle, starting there, and then go there. Hi. Hi. So, speaking of uh, fragility and catastrophe, there are, you know, uh, prognostications out there. Uh, I don't know if they're agents, but they're out there saying that the internet might be part of uh, an industrial system that is itself indefinitely unsustainable because it's all fueled by people, and it's going to be that way, possibly all around some point in the 21st century. Um, and in that case, you might see a sort of contraction and reversion to a more agricultural society. And this thing that we're trying so hard to theorize and develop models of is creating networks of networks to talk about might start to seem sort of vaporous and ephemeral in the long course of things. But at the same time, I'm wondering, you know, if we move from a situation which is no longer really about resisting neoliberalism so much as resisting feudalism, if any of the lessons from this type of situation can be extracted forward into that type of catastrophic scenario. Right. That issue thought about that. Yeah, um, interesting. I see the catastrophe I'm more leaning towards is global climate change. Um, then well, they're, the, they're definitely Yeah, they're climate. definitely intertwined. And again, you know, like Diagnoses of global climate change are impossible without the internet. It's the same way that this analysis I'm offering is impossible without um, the internet as well. So the, the question of the catastrophe and the catastrophic is certainly an interesting one. Um, I'm not quite sure that I'm not quite sure that it's it's necessarily um, the most helpful way of thinking through this, but I would uh, what I would point to one way that has addressed this in really interesting ways and in resources and the possibility of networking and certain anarchism is King Stanley Robinson's Mars series. Um, absolutely brilliant. And I think there he's dealing with these questions of, of collectives which have been completely influenced by technology and its imaginings, but is not itself technological per se, although it's you know very dependent on various survival mechanisms. Um, but I think the, the deeper question you're ask, asking me is to what extent is the technological central to this notion of the network? Um, 
and how we can think through the relationship of the technological to the social and the cultural. Um, and I think that that's an excellent question. And one of the reasons why networks have taken off is precisely when now people say networks, it seems a way of indicating a certain implication of the social and the technological. Right? Um, so I think that's a, a, an open question. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to speak broadly towards a specific point. Okay. So in other words, basically, you know, uh, a lot of your, to me, I think a lot of your points um, in regards to, um, you know, crisis and climate and, um, you know, um, networks and mm -hmm. communities and that sort of thing, in regards to systems theory, you know, is, do you think that our understanding of, the, of these things might have to do in part with, you know, the, the, the granularity of the subject? In other words, this is sort of like the forestry. Forester's issue and the the, the public role and that sort of thing in, in their you know in, in their forecast that sort of thing. One of the one of the problems with Forrester was you know um, both plus and minus for his uh, for his models was the you know was was the granularity of his of his of his uh, of the parameters within the system model. Right. You know, and so what I'm wondering here is, is that you know in, in looking at you know this you know this interesting of, of networks and that sort of thing, and I'm just kind of wondering. It's sort of like the regularity of the event versus like the span versus the trending and or sort of like the size of the event and then how far down do we go until we get to the point of resolution that we can be satisfied, you know, with you know our our uh, the results of our, our investigation. Well let me uh, that's a great question. Uh, let me put it in one way. Um, that what I find compelling about network analysis and how um, now, work analysis is different from graph theory, which is the precedent, is precisely the ways in which it enables a certain movement to the scale. It's not simply just the granularity, but rather what can move allegedly swiftly from the large to the individual. Um, but at the same time, if you think of this in terms of nodes and edges, there's also a fundamental unknowability about what the node is, right? Like, and, and to demand you must know what the node is is actually to stop the possibility of network analysis. Right? It's something that you just can't deal with. I mean, so this is why in network analysis as well, there's all these questions of the relationship between causality and correlation, right? So it's been correlated that if your friends get fat, you're gonna get fat, right? That's a correlation, right? The question is, is that causality? Like somehow they're, you know, um, and, and, and so there, in other words, it works at certain notions of relationality but doesn't get to the, the underlying causality, which is also why it, it can bracket off those questions in certain ways. I just wondered if you thought about the story here in connection with uh, the field of these ideas of Jefferson's philosopher and the philosophy of the Depends on Jefferson. I mean, we don't seem like Jefferson. Because if you were, say, to 
um, be a student and you're never posted to Facebook. Your parents would be like, what, what, you know, your friends would be like, what are you doing? Right? What, is my child still alive? Right? So there's ways in which you can have this sort of replication that allows one to withdraw and enables one to constantly insist on a certain monitoring structure as well. So that's how I would think we're not the loss of something per se, but rather different ways in which red, in which what reticence gave us is being worked out. <coughs> Highly unreticent answers. <laughs> 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 uh, so there were two questions. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 